been a lot of talk about bridging the gap between police and African-American communities after fatal police shootings of black men and the attack on white police officers. Now some big name celebrities are speaking out, but not everyone agrees their focus is on target. 23 Ways You Could Be Killed If You're Black in America is a chilling political statement from superstars like Alicia Keys, U2's Bono, Beyonce, Chris Rock, Pink and others about cases where blacks died at the hands of police across the United States. It's a somber expression of tensions that some say are reaching a boiling point. It's a powder keg across this nation. You think Ferguson went up in flames. You think Baltimore went up in flames. People are fed up. And the flames across America, nobody will be able to douse if we don't start getting some justice because you may not think Black Lives Matter, but black people do. While the Black Lives Matter movement navigates its way through sensitive territory riddled with misunderstandings, the author of The War on Cops says they should really be thanking police. In New York City alone, there's 10,000 minority males who are alive today who would have been dead had homicide levels remained at their early 1990s levels. The Department of Justice statistics show police kill more whites than any other race, but more unarmed blacks are killed than any other race, despite the fact they're about 13 percent of the population. McDonald says there's another statistic to look at. A police officer is 18 and a half times more likely to be killed by a black male than an unarmed black male is to be killed by a police officer. She says the real issue is crime. Some African American leaders would agree, but they'd add that more must be done to bring police in the community closer. We want to make sure that no one else loses their life this summer due to violence. Be it police violence, be it black on black violence. We must end the violence now. Some voices are calling out for mutual respect and new ways to heal the wounds. Let's find out what our guests have to say about that. Joining us is Darren Porcher. Um, Dr. Porcher is a former NYPD lieutenant. He's currently a professor of criminal justice at universities here in New York City. And he's also a commentator on radio and television. Also with us is City Council Member Jumani Williams. He represents the 45th District in Brooklyn. That's East Flatbush, Flatbush, Midwood, and Flatlands. He's been very active in policing issues as well as gun violence issues in our neighborhoods. Thank you both for being with us. We really Thanks appreciate for having it. Us. Um, Giovanni, I want to start with you on this because you've been on the, this issue for a long, long time. You see it for your constituents and you see it as both a legislator and also as an African-American man on the streets. What do you see? Are we as divided as p some people think we are? Uh, I think so, actually. On this issue, I think we're, we're generally not as divided as people think. There's a lot of commonality. But on this issue, I think there's a, a bright line uh, for a lot of people. And I think uh, that's what one of the issues are and we have to as you said have an honest conversation of what things look like through race in this country uh, when you bring up race people begin to shut down but it really is a problem and so um, one of the issues for me is we have to focus on policing and I think we were talking outside the other issue is not just policing and so whatever issues we have with the institution of policing are very real but those same issues uh, exist when it comes to employment, education, housing. So you're uh, saying it's a, it's a bigger issue. Darren Porcher, Dr. Porcher, what do you think? Are we as divided as a community or as, you know, between the police and the community as some people think we are? Well, I think that we are very, very divided. Um, you can't broad brush it. And it, we have different communities that have different aspects of division. And we, one of the things that you look at is the school system, for example. You see, in essence, segregation in a lot of these schools. And we look at what the landscape here in New York City is. We have 365 square miles and eight and a half million people. However, we have African Americans that live in some neighborhoods, Caucasians that live in others, and then we have having more and more infusion in different communities such as Harlem and Bedford-Stuyvesant. However, we still have a ways to go. So to answer your question and connection is, do we have division? I believe absolutely so, and I think it's worse than it is. I don't think that this thing is going understated. Do you, do you think this is the tip of the iceberg, what we're seeing now, the, the tensions, the, the expressions of frustration that people I have? I hope so because that will mean something would change. But uh, historically, we've had these peaks and then it comes back down and we pretend it's gone away, but it's just latent. So I'm hoping we can use this as a time to really have. The more we push off this discussion, the more we're real about it, the more angry people are when it peaks again. Um, thankfully, through the advent of social media, 
uh, people are seeing brightly what we have known for quite some time. I think that's helpful. I think uh, the fact that you have uh, not just black folks out there now, you have multiple uh, people from backgrounds saying, yo, this is a problem. And they, they haven't been lying. They haven't been making it up. They haven't been exaggerating. It's right there on video, sort of like uh, the advent of television did at the Civil Rights Movement. Like, for example, with the Philando Castile case in Minnesota, the, the girlfriend who was uh, live streaming everything on Facebook, we saw that. A lot of people understood it. We've seen a lot of people in or the Mr. Smalls uh, in, right. in East New York, where they told us one thing. And it, they told us something very specific. And he was punching the guy in the face and all this and that. And the video was astonishing. He literally walks up and gets shot. And this officer, uh, unlike anybody who's not an officer, hasn't been arrested, no charges yet. Okay, but is the issue and are the divisions, do they really, is it a clean cut division along race lines? Because you look at the Delron Small case, that officer was black. You look at some of these other cases and it's, it's not quite so clear. So is it about, is, is the bigger discussion, how are we policing our communities? The way we're policing it doesn't fit the times or it's outdated? Well, when we think, when we look in connection with how with the policing strategies that are employed, law enforcement or police agencies are broken into two components. You have something we refer to as order, order maintenance. Order maintenance focuses specifically on enforcement related activities. And then we have the second piece, which is the public servant. The public servant is that police officer that engages in the policing community relationship. Now, when we look at police departments historically, they've, in, they've input monstrous amounts of money into order maintenance. So we think in terms of counterterrorism, enforcement related acts. However, and the, that's something that's ever so evolving. And the but militarization when, of police right, departments. Right. But when we look at the, the the public servant piece, we're still in terms of the community, the police community engagement, and uh, that's something that dates by the 70s. From the 70s up until this point, they have yet to evolve in that. It's been more focused on the order maintenance component. So how do we drive? How do we bring Bring up that public servant piece, and that's one of the things that I feel that this administration here in New York City has desperately failed. When uh, Mayor, Bl when excuse me, when Mayor Bloomberg was in office, I constantly heard De Blasio state that this is a tale of two cities. When he comes in, he's going to change things. He highlighted the Floyd versus the City of New York. That was a stop and frisk case. However, once he came into office as the mayor. It seems like he's just regressed, and Police Commissioner Bratton has kind of done his own thing. Bratton isn't the policymaker. The mayor is the policymaker, but I'm seeing something very different. All right, we're gonna... to, because one thing you said, because the officer was black, uh, I want to make it clear uh, that that doesn't change the fact that race is a factor here. And so it's very okay, important. Okay, ex explain that to people, because a lot of people, and, and I'm repeating to you and asking you guys a lot sure. of the things people have been saying on social media, have been asking me, and the, the questions that have been coming up in the public dialogue about this. If the officer is black, if the person shot and killed by that officer is also black, how is race not a factor? Because well, when you look at it, uh, in that case, you're thinking about how, how men and women in blue are viewing uh, men and women or who are black and brown. And so it doesn't matter if the officer's black, brown, or white. Uh, I've, I've known not, you know, I've known officers who are, look like me and have a lot to prove and sometimes or could be worse even than people that aren't. But the other important thing that, to point out is that uh, it's how those communities are policed and how those communities are structurally ignore, ignored. And that part, that second part, uh, is very important because if it's a, a black or brown community, you can rest assured that the numbers when it comes to uh, unemployment, when it comes to lack of affordable housing, when it comes to education, mirror uh, the amounts of complaints of uh, police brutality and violence are in those communities. But Jumani, what do you say to the people, and, and I'm sure you've heard this many times at the city council hearings and, and on the streets, what do you say to people who go, well, there's more police activity, there's more aggressive police activity in communities of color because there's more crime there? Uh, well, one, there's two things there. Uh, that's not 100% accurate because if you look at something like uh, bicycle summonses, uh, you see tremendous amounts of uh, bicycle summonses in the black and brown communities as opposed to the white communities. And I believe that they ride bikes. Uh, I've seen it with my own eyes. And so you see uh, enforcement that's just uh, so much harsher on one side, even when it's equal, uh, when it's equal uh, violations. At also. They are correct that there are certain violent crimes uh, that are a little bit more, but the question is why? 
And the answer to that question is similar to the problems with policing and, and brutality. And no one wants to talk about those questions. Those communities have been uh, starved structurally. Access uh, inequality has been real in those communities. And we have to have a discussion of personal accountability with the historical uh, denial of things that are needed in those communities at the same time. People want to separate. They want to talk about personal responsibility, but not how do we fix this structurally so that any human being you put in a situation is going to respond in the same way. We know what's going to happen. All right. This is Street Soldiers. I'm your host, Lisa Evers. When we come back, I'm going to ask our guests, how do we even talk about this? What terms are offensive? What terms are uh, acceptable? And what kind of language should we be using as we address this? That's coming up next. You can use All Eyes Matter for another conversation, say something else, but if you're using it in response to Black Lives Matter, that's what the problem is. Let me ask you this, in terms of the conversation, in terms of the language, if you say communities of color, people get upset. If you say African American, people who are not African American but have a darker complexion get upset because their national origin is not being recognized. What should we even say as we talk about this? A black issue, a white issue, what should we use, Jumani? One, we, we should co approach this with empathy for both sides. Right. And understand, I have, I used to say white privilege a lot, and I realize when I say white privilege, people think I'm calling them racist, even though I'm not. Now, you might be. I don't want to take that away, but that wasn't my point there. So I've tried to get acute to what is triggering something in someone and then try to rephrase it, because if you use those trigger words, then people stop listening and the conversation is not helpful. Absolutely. Um, the fact that folks are trying to find a word that completes their identity is a factor of American history, and then people have been forced to do that. And so I don't know if we have the correct language yet, but one thing I will say for sure, um, the more melanin is in your skin that you have, the more likely that you have these issues, and that's very real. And we look at the we look at the victims. We look at the victims, and and, and that bears it out. That's that is exactly. There's a complexion correct. connection without a doubt. That is exactly correct. All right, Darren, what do you think about that in terms of the language that we use? In terms of I think well, how how we should say because whites will say this, people will say other people will say too who are, are non-black. How do you talk about this with be, being sensitive and being open-minded and yet not being offensive? Because the last thing you want to do if you're having a dialogue with somebody, as Jumani said, is you use a trigger word or be offensive. Well, I, you know, I don't want to date myself in terms of the age, but I remember years ago, black people were referred to as colored. If people were fine with that, then it changed, it rotated into black. Then it rotated into African American. And the truth of the matter is, you refer to people how they want to be referred to. And once you, once you catch that, study people and gain that understanding, and that's what you refer to them as. But in connection with this conversation about race, I think it's a very necessary conversation. When we look at what President Obama spoke about out yesterday at the memorial service in connection with the uh, the slain officers he really introduced the necessity of having this conversation not that I agree with the organizer organizers of Black Lives Matter however what they have done is they've introduced a narrative of a divisive relationship between the african-american community and police and we're now having it on a national level that being said once you identify with what people want to be referred to, you must have this conversation. Because if you don't have the conversation, it's like the boogeyman in the closet. No one, it's never right, addressed. Right, the elephant in the room but that nobody wants to talk about. once we find out, once we address the conversation, now we can develop specific antidotes let me talk to the issues that one, we have. One thing that's important with this, anything, any response besides you are right when you say Black Lives Matter is a problem. If someone says Black Lives Matter and you say anything besides yes it does, that is a problem because that is the whole issue here. When people say black lives matter, you're saying all lives matter. And people are not understanding, we know all lives matter. All the data shows that other people's lives matter. What we're saying now here is the data has presented itself to us that black lives don't matter. Like the Black is Beautiful movement way back when. It wasn't that anything else wasn't beautiful. It was that everything was showing us and people were trying to tell us that black was ugly, black was bad. So therefore, yeah, black is beautiful. And it's the same vein here. And so that is a trigger point, and it should be. We should be allowed to assert something in the face of all the damaging evidence that we're seeing. And what about, Jumani, the, the, the subtext and the tone? Because the whole debate that's erupted over Black Lives Matter is almost like, are you even allowed to come up with your own term? Do you get that sense from it? I do. And what we should do is allow Black Lives Matter to stand alone. And, and when using that context, don't, just don't use something else. 
Uh, you, you can use All Lives Matter for another conversation, say something else, but if you're using it in response to Black Lives Matter, that's what the problem is. You should allow people who are suffering the ability to lead a conversation in dealing with that suffering. And when and you take that away, you're, 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 you're violating them again. And you're talking, you're talking about f facts, you're talking about statistics, because the other thing in this national debate that has kind of erupted in various media forms and social media forms is more whites are killed by police officers every year than blacks. That is true. However, more according to blacks. the New York Times, according more to the... More unarmed blacks are killed by police. Uh, and, right. And according to the... It's how you break break down the statistics and according to the New York Times they say of all the unarmed people shot and killed by police in 2015 40 percent were black even though or were black men even though black men are six percent of the American population to speak to what you're saying and, and you're most, saying more black and more unarmed black men are. more unarmed blacks are killed more Caucasians are killed by police annually however more unarmed blacks are killed by and, and also police. there are more white Populist. Well, so, yeah, you also right. have to well, take well, a look at the Exactly. So the black the population is 13% of the United and States. And also, most of the officers, unfortunately, uh, who are murdered are murdered by white people. That, that, you and know, you, that's still, a, you still right. get blamed for even having a discussion. Right. And so, it, it just people warp everything. They don't use. I found it's very difficult to have a conversation with someone where facts don't matter. Thing that gets keeps getting thrown out, uh, especially among white media, is the black on you know black on black crime. Why aren't they as why aren't they as outraged about that as they are in in their terminology so, about black about bl blacks getting killed by police? So what do you one, say to that? I, ref I refuse to uh, continue to use the language uh, that is that is made just to continue the violations of community. So I'm not going to say black on black crime. I'm going to say violence, violence in the black community. Period. Um, as he described. That type of violence, and whatever violence you discuss, and crime in particular, happens parochially. So white people commit crimes among white people. It is about 80-something percent, uh, roughly the same as black. Uh, two, you don't tell us which violence we should speak about. Don't tell us one violence is more important than the other violence. Three, there are, du there are hundreds and hundreds of people across this country who are dealing with the violence in their community every single there day. There are. Now, because you don't come down to those communities and participate doesn't mean it is not happening. Uh, and the third is the most important. The question is, why is there violence in this particular community? And the answer is similar to the reason that we're discussing police brutality. There is structural inequities when you look through a lens of race that has caused this. That doesn't mean we can't hold people responsible because you don't have to fall in the trap. But you should honestly describe that the trap is there to begin with. You cannot have a public safety discussion that only includes the police. I think that is a fundamental flaw. Law enforcement is not the only response to the violence in these communities. And as long as it is, we're going to have the same problems. You can't ask police to go in to solve all the structural inequities. How can police go in and solve unemployment and solve housing issues and solve education issues? It can't be done. So law and order has to grow out of the realm of just being law enforcement. And until you recognize that, you are furthering the problems in this country. We have to be honest about why the violence is going there, and you have to be honest with yourself why are you describing it as black on black and why are you juxtaposing it to the violence. I just heard an elected police. official do that yesterday. This is street soldiers. We're talking about one of the most urgent issues facing our country, police and our communities. We'll be back right after this. I want to thank our guest, Dr. Darren Porcher, former NYPD lieutenant, city council member Jumani Williams, for being a part of this episode of Street Soldiers. And remember, use your mind. It's your best weapon. I hope it's your only weapon. I'm Lisa Evers. Let's push for peace.